stay with a very short introduction of our wonderful guest speaker today, Madeline Burkhardt. Dr. Burkhardt um, has been teaching in critical disability studies and very soon starting a tenure track position um, uh, in the same subject in a graduate program as well. The posters distributed on this talk where we had two versions of that. One version was with a longer abstract and um, shorter biography. The other poster expanded on the biography. Um, so you have seen probably some of each. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's usually our um, a mode of presentation or introduction here is very, very summary. I usually leave it to the guests to take a minute or two to say something about their work, where they're coming from, what they are actually currently working on, um, and then move to the uh, presentation itself. I guess today I have a good excuse to do that just because we have sent two posters. Um, but regardless, I think, um, we are in good hands. Uh, the I'll just say something about the background to uh, the reason I decided to um, bring this into the context of a classroom topic. Uh, the students in this class um, have been putting up with me for a, quite a few weeks right now on um, a course entitled Broad Disability and Technology. So we have looked at the different aspects of the different kinds of intersection between law, technology, and disability, and try to expand of, under of our understanding beyond just questions of accessibility, which is um, the questions that are mostly introduced as the only way technology and disability connect. The last item on our syllabus is about reproductive questions around disability. And there is no other uh, more qualified person yeah. than Dr. Burkhardt uh, presenting on this topic. And it was quite a serendipity that right when I was designing this syllabus and the course was being started, um, it was the beginning of the fellowship uh, stint of Dr. Berkot with us. Um, I was as excited to organize this as I was excited to read uh, Madeline's application for this fellowship earlier on in the summer. And so uh, for me, so it's been a subject long in expectation and I very much look forward to learning from you, Madeline, today. With that, I guess I leave it in your hands. If you could please very quickly, maybe a minute or two, say something about your past work, your ongoing work at this point, and then we get to the topic. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, speak for about an hour or an hour and 15 minutes or so, and we can leave some time for questions. That would be great. Thank you, Hengima, so much. And thank you, all of you, for welcoming me today to this time with you. I'll introduce myself very briefly. I just want to also say Hengema was, um, <laughs> when she said there's no better person to speak about this, that's not actually true, but I'm going to uh, engage with this topic with you this afternoon because it is of great interest to me. Um, so as Hengema mentioned, I, um, I have a PhD in critical disability studies that I got at York University. I've taught in the critical disability studies graduate program at York University at the master's and PhD level in those streams. And I also have taught at York in the School of Health Policy and Management undergraduate courses. And I'm also currently teaching in disability studies at Western University. So um, those are my areas. Um, my area of research to date has primarily been with people who have been labeled with some kind of intellectual disability. Um, my doctoral research was, um, I worked with people who had uh, survived being institutionalized in long stay institutions in the in the province of Ontario because they were identified as having an intellectual disability. So I did um, a project with 
those survivors as well as members of their families to really explore um, people's own experiences of institutionalization due to being labeled with a disability, but also the experiences within the, the families. And so that was my doctoral work. So this project that I'm working on right now is a little different in some ways. It is still very much a relational study where I'm trying to um, understand the ways in which this particular phenomenon that I'm going to talk about this afternoon has affected families, but also really digging at some of the historical ontology of these things that have happened in the last hundred years in our history that directly affect people with disabilities, people who are labeled with disabilities, but also uh, people in their circles. So it's connected in that way. It's a, a different group of people, um, um, but it's of interest. So what I'm going to do is pull up my slides and uh, then we can get started. So can everybody see my slides and can you hear me? Just wanna make sure. Can you, yes. Okay, thank you for the um, indication that you can hear me and see my slides. If at any point any of that starts to um, become shaky, please let me know. And as Hengema said, I, I have, I don't know exactly how long my talk will be. Certainly, I think it'll be within an hour and then we'll have lots of time for discussion and questions. Um, so on this first slide is the title of my talk, Injury Agency, Competing Constructions of Canadian Women in the Thalidomide Crisis. And the two images on the slide, one on the right shows um, some bottles of pills, medication. And for those of you who are not familiar with the thalidomide story in Canada, that will soon become clear why I've, I've chosen that image. And then on the left is sort of an abstract image of um, what looks like a, a woman holding a child on their hip, a sort of an abstract line drawing. So um, Liel and Hengema already did the land acknowledgement, just uh, I prepared one also just that we are mindful of the spaces we are occupying today and um, people who've used these spaces over time and that were um, meant to share them peaceably. So I hold that as I move forward in this presentation. I also really want to acknowledge the support of a, this, um, a SHRC Insight Development Grant that has really helped me with this research and also, of course, to the Institute for Feminist Legal Scholarship at Osgood, which has provided me the space to do some of this writing and thinking and, and research and also lots of academic collegiality over the past several weeks, so I'm grateful for everyone there. So what I really want to do today is, first of all, just provide a summary of the thalidomide story in Canada for those of us who are not familiar with it. And um, I just need to give a little disclaimer at the beginning is that this is a huge story. And due to limits of time and also expertise, I'm going to be everything we talk about today is me um, scraping the surface of what is there. Um, but my real goal this afternoon is to interrogate the whole context around the story, what was going on at the time of this thalidomide crisis, primarily due to the time period, looking at the post-World War II situation, what was going on in people's homes, the domestic world, um, but at the same time, looking at women's increasing agency during this time period. So I'm interrogating the context with a focus on women who are involved in this story and, and women who were living in Canada at the time. This inevitably takes us to a, a conversation around um, women's reproductive rights and access to abortion that actually is part of this story or it feeds, it informs the discussions around access to abortion and abortion rights. So um, we will get into that. Um, the conversation also inevitably leads to some discussion about drugs, pharmaceuticals, and the idea of a brave new world. And through these explorations, I'll be talking about implications on women, implications on our understandings and representations of disability. And then at the end, I just kind of try and draw some of that together and looking at how um, feminism and disability studies can inform each other. Maybe there's some productive potential there that we can learn from this uh, examination this afternoon. 
So I just want to make a brief note on language. The first is that with this thalidomide story, you'll see on the title on this slide, I use the words thalidomide story. I, I've thought a lot about how to refer to this, and I, I still feel like I'm working through this. Quite often, the thalidomide story is, is referred to as a thalidomide tragedy or the thalidomide catastrophe. And sometimes I hesitate to use those words because of the negative connotations. And yes, this is a, it was a real scandal and it had some vast, far reaching and damaging implications and effects on people. However, I, I still am grappling with the, the, the most correct words to use. I think scandal is a good one because it was uh, a scandal in the way that it unfolded and how it actually happened. And I'd be happy to have uh, some discussion at the end about that kind of thing, that the language that we use. So often I'll use the word the little mite story. I also don't think story is really adequate to describe everything. So I'm still working on that. Also around um, language around disability. Um, for those of you who study um, disability or are part of the disability studies community, you will be familiar with this debate or this conversation. Um, like when I was a student, when I was growing up to, we were encouraged to use the term people with disabilities, i.e. people first language. And that is still embraced by many people within the disability, within various disability communities. Um, at the same time, more recent scholarship over the last 20, 30 years has really um, unpacked the way that what disability really is, are the obstacles and barriers, political, social, um, representational barriers that exist for people with impairments in society. And therefore people are disabled by those obstacles and thus it's more accurate to actually say disabled people. So I'll probably find myself going back and forth between the two in this discussion. I just wanted to make clear that it's not meant to designate um, a, really a favoring over one or the other. Both these terms are used still quite a bit and there is lots of conversation about that. Okay, so just to begin to explain briefly the thalidomide story to provide an overview. So in the late 1950s, early 1960s, thousands of women around the world took um, the medication, which is commonly known as thalidomide. And many of the women who took this medication gave birth to children with significant impairments. The most noticeable of those were uh, or absent limbs, either arms or legs. In the medical profession, this was often referred to as phocomelia, which quite literally translates to um, seal arms or seal limbs. And that was in reference to how the medical profession described this particular condition where children um, often had limbs growing out of their body in places that were closer to their trunk than they would normally. And there were also other internal malformations that were caused by um, the consumption of this, this drug. Uh, some children had heart issues, heart defects, or defects of the ears, um, digestive system, et cetera. And what is interesting here is that people who, survivors of this have noted that the physical complications from this continue to manifest. It, it wasn't sort of they were born with, with these conditions and, and that was it. They are not static. They, they actually um, have developed and change over time as well. So the epicenter of this phenomenon, this event was in uh, what was then called West Germany, now just Germany, near the Belgian border, a small town called Aachen, which was where this company called uh, and forgive me if I say this wrong, for those of you who speak German, I'll probably say it incorrectly, but it's Kemi Grunenthal, which basically interestingly means like Green Valley Drug Company or something like that. Anyway, I'll just refer to it as CG from now on. So this, this pharmaceutical company um, was a post-war business that uh, developed in the wake of the Second World War um, that was making, first of all, just herbal medications and 
body products and things like that. And then they started to branch into actually making medications. So the epicenter of the thalidomide story was in the town where this uh, factory, where this business was located. And that was because um, the wives of many of the men who worked in the company were given free samples of this medication in the late 1950s. And so they were the first ones to have children who had these physical disabilities. So a bit of a timeline here. I'm just trying to move all our faces out of the way so I can see this. In 1956, um, the company received official approval to begin marketing this drug, which they called Contergon. And just so you know also is that this drug has had many different marketed names every country that they that um, marketed the drug or that approved it had a different name for it so in Canada it was the, the overall name is thalidomide but there were also different brand names so in 1956 the company starts marketing the drug and by the end of that year the first thalidomide affected child was born in that very town to the um, wife the spouse of a man who was working in the company. Yet no connection was made between the consumption of this medication and the, the child's condition, or if there was a connection made, it was certainly not made public or it was not, um, yeah, like it was, it was not discussed as a possibility. Sorry, I just have to figure out how to move this ahead. There we go. So by 1957, they were officially, they had officially launched the drug in Germany. So they received approval. And then a year later, they were launching the drug in Germany. And really the drug was being marketed as a bit of a catch-all miracle drug that it was supposed to reduce pain and anxiety. Um, it, was, it was touted as being non-addictive, something that was impossible to overdose on and something that was in their words, completely safe. Now, we don't have time today to go into all the ins and outs of the ways in which this company failed to adequately test the drug. They clearly did, despite the fact that they have contested that all the way along in terms of what they were capable of doing at the time when they started marketing it. But basically the drug was really being pushed as kind of a, a drug that would heal all your ails in, in an over-the-counter way. It reduced pain, it would reduce anxiety, you can use it as a way to fall asleep at night, these kinds of things. So they began promoting this drug really, really aggressively. By 1959, this was the most consumed sleeping pill in Germany. And I just need to point out also that the drug was being put into cough syrups for children and parents were even using it as a way to calm their children down. And so it was it was really, really popular. It was used in many, many households, particularly in Germany where it had originated. And soon after that, the company began a really aggressive marketing campaign around the world. So that was why this um, thalidomide appeared all around the developed world and in parts uh, in, in some Southern countries as well. So in Europe, many countries um, used, uh, took up the, the medication, Canada did, Australia, Japan, countries in South America, South Africa, et cetera. And um, what was, this was what some of the earlier researchers began to notice when there was when they were trying to figure out what was going on, when the children with impairments started to be born, some people wondered if it was some kind of virus that was happening. And then some researchers said, well, viruses don't actually really stop at borders. As we all know, over the last three years of our life, viruses do not stop at borders. So it had to be something that was specific to each of these countries where this was being observed, right? And that was when they started to zero in on the the realization that it must be connected to something that was common to all these countries, but would stop at borders. So that was one way that they started to figure out what was going on. So in, sorry, again, I just have to move my slides a bit. So it was officially introduced, officially approved and introduced into the Canadian market on April 1st, 1961. So this was a few years after it, the drug had been marketed in Germany and in other parts of the world. So Canada was a relative latecomer 
to this uh, medication. And it was marketed in Canada as something called Kevadon. And there were two different companies that promoted it in Canada. One was based in the United States, Richardson Merrill. That was mostly in English speaking Canada. Then there was a different company based in Montreal, Horner, that was promoting the drug in Quebec. Well, if you look at the timeline, it doesn't, it's not surprising that the first known the linamide affected child was born the next January, January 20th, 1962. So you can really see the close connection there in terms of timeline. So the, the other thing that's really interesting about this, if you go back to the previous slide, you, Canada approved it and started marketing it in 1961. This was in spite of the fact that as early as 1960, doctors in different parts of the world were starting to notice some bad side effects from the medication, right? Um, there was a doctor in Scotland who wrote a letter to, um, I believe it was the, either the British Medical Association Journal or the Lancet, I'd have to look up which one, because he noticed that patients who'd been taking thalidomide for an extended period, like several months, were starting to experience something called neurasthesia, which is like, you know, when you get tingles in, in your extremities and there were other neurological signs that all was not right. And the doctor believed that it was because of this drug, thalidomide. He started to um, write about this and publish about it. The company really, really pushed back. Um, the Kemi Grunenthal really disputed that there was any evidence that it was directly related to the drug. But after enormous pressure, they began to put warnings on some of the packaging that maybe people would experience side effects if they use the drug for a long time. But there was still no connection, no warnings about women who were expecting not taking the medication. But then um, around the same time, a doctor, pediatrician in Germany, whose name was Dr. Lenz, he began to notice a, a really rapid increase in the number of births of children with impairments in this small part of Germany where he was living and working. And so together with the dad of one of the children who had been born. They just started a, a really rudimentary research project going door to door in their communities to find out, you know, do you, do you know of any children who've been born with impairments or do you have a child in your household who's been born with an impairment? And they started to gather evidence that the numbers were really, really high in this one region. And this is when they started to get a sense that this was also a geographic phenomenon, not just, a, uh, you know, it wasn't like a virus or something. And the doctor started to make connections through speaking with the mums that they had consumed this medication and he started to, to make some conclusions about this. So this, this next line on the slide, after extensive pressure, Kemi Gurenthal removed Contragan, the drug, from the market at near the end of 1961. Now, that, I mean, there could be pages of stuff written in between those two points on the slide, between the second point and the third point, because it's, it's fascinating to read about the way um, Dr. Lenz applied pressure to the company. He went to the, the ministry. He presented at doctor's conferences. He was drawing the connections and how much the company was pushing back and saying, you have no evidence that it's this drug. How can you say that? And there was there's an enormous amount documented about the back and forth. But finally, after a lot of pressure from the government, not because necessarily it was the doctor, saying this, it was from the government that they um, finally removed Contragon from the market at the end of November, 1961. So what's really, really important to note is that thalidomide remained on the Canadian market until March 2nd, the following year. So that's three full months during which many women in Canada consumed the drug because they had no idea that this could be harmful to um, to their fetus, right? And there's still a lot of questions about why that is. Why did it take the Canadian government three full months to remove the drug from the market when the parent company in Germany had already removed it under pressure from the German government. So this is something that, in, well, maybe not surprising, I've had, it's difficult to find out exactly what's going on, what was the thinking behind that, or what was the non-thinking behind that. Um, it hasn't been easy for me to really uncover that. There's lots of speculation about, was it just ignoring it? Was it an assumption that 
Um, letting people know about it in a casual way was sufficient. There was one, what happened, one thing that did happen was the government advised family doctors to send letters to their patients who they had given samples to or who they had you know suggested the drug to to warn them but that was about the extent of it it was a very very casual um non-aggressive campaign to encourage to take it off the shelves and there was also resistance from pharmacists because this was a big money maker in Canada as well. So there's lots of reasons why there is this three month gap that we need to do a little bit more work on. You know, the, the timing of the situation also, they were corresponding by letter. Um, the, the ministry in Ottawa, the federal Health Canada sent letters to doctors saying, hey, there's some evidence that maybe there's a connection between this drug and impairments. Some doctors didn't even open the letter. Like there was, there wasn't, there wasn't email messaging or phone calls to the same extent that we use today. So communication was poor. The government did not take a strong enough stance. Government uh, doctors were in some cases slow to react. Same with pharmacists. So you have the situation where there's a three month overlap where many women in Canada continue to take the medication. And indeed, I have spoken to a thalidomide survivor who was born um, in 1963. So she was born well after this all ended, but the medication was hanging around in the family medicine cabinet. The parents had not heard that this was a dangerous thing. So we forget that the, the ways of communication were very different then. And um, a lot of babies were born during this time period. So I just want to comment on a couple of things about the about legal battles that have ensued. So in total, there have been about 115 confirmed thalidomide survivors in Canada. And many of those have since passed away. But um, confirmed is a really key word there because the government, um, and again, we don't have time to go into all of it today, but there's been legal and financial settlements with thalidomide survive, between the thalidomide survivors in Canada and the federal government at different time periods and in different ways. But the government has always insisted that thalidomide survivors are able to demonstrate that it indeed was thalidomide that caused their impairment. Um, and so, as you can imagine, that involves a lot of paperwork, uh, confirmation. Usually that meant the mothers had to go to their doctors to for the doctors to confirm that indeed it was the thalidomide that they had given the mother or suggested she take, et cetera, and that that was what had caused it. So if the doctor was no longer available or wasn't so willing to confirm that, that could raise complications for the family as well. So it was not always straightforward for families to confirm that indeed this child had been affected by thalidomide. This is given rise to extensive legal battles around the world. Again, there's whole books written about individual cases um, and uh, including in Australia, there's a the whole book about it, a really amazing account uh, in the UK etc. And it wasn't until 2015 that finally Canadian survivors received long-term compensation from the Canadian federal government for the harms that had been caused them. And there had been previous settlements that were much less valuable, um, where they uh, received a lump sum and it wasn't sufficient to survive on. So it was only in 2015. So if you think about that, people were like in their mid 50s before they had any sense of financial security from the from the federal government, uh, knowing that they could use those funds to to live a reasonably good life for the rest of their lives. Really kind of shocking in this, as any thalidomide survivor will tell you, is that the company in charge has never officially acknowledged their responsibility or at least from the perspective of thalidomide survivors, they have never officially acknowledged their responsibility. In 2012, they gave a formal apology. And so I've taken a little bit of the text from this apology here on the slide, and you can see what you think. <laughs> but the, the, the person in charge of the company at the time said, we ask for forgiveness that for nearly 50 years, we didn't find a way of reaching out to you 
we ask that you regard our long silence as a sign of the shock that your fate caused in us. So you can see from those words, they never actually acknowledged that they were responsible. They asked for forgiveness that they hadn't reached out to them. And they said, we were quiet because we were shocked at what had happened to you. So it was a very, very roundabout way of not really saying anything. So I, all, all of you who are law students might um, enjoy looking at that full apology and kind of tearing it apart and seeing what was actually really going on there. Obviously, the, the company was protecting itself. The image that I have on the slide there is of interest just because at the time of the apology, the company put this sculpture, this statue that you see on the slide up in the lobby of the company in Germany. And they said it was meant to act as a reminder that that this had stemmed from um, inadequate testing and, and that it had caused harm. So you, you might read that as a bit of an apology, kind of, I guess, but not really. But what the thalidomide survivor, I spoke to a thalidomide survivor in Germany, and what she told me is that this sculpture, the one on the left of the, the child sitting in the chair, was actually not originally designed and created for the thalidomide survivors, that it was uh, something that a board member, now I may not have all the details absolutely correct in this story, but it had something to do with someone who was connected to the company, um, had a friend who was an artist who constructed this sculpture and it wasn't originally intended for the thalidomide survivors, it was for somebody else but then when the, this person from the company found out that this sculpture was available, then they, they asked if they could use it for this monument in the lobby. So even the statue itself, the Little Mind survivors are saying, it, it wasn't even really created for us. So there's just a sense of deep hurt and anger against this company and their unwillingness to fully acknowledge their role in this story. Now, I see there's a chat. I just don't know if... Um, okay, so maybe we'll look at some of the chat things later. Sorry, I just don't want to get distracted. Okay, so next, what have we got here? So I just want to point out that this story, the thalidomide tragedy, has been discussed a lot. There's a lot of writing out there from legal perspectives, which mainly focus on issues of culpability, like who is responsible and why. Also political perspectives, like to what extent were governments responsible? How did governments also fail their citizens in this story? And also medical perspectives um, and scientific perspectives, like what this drug actually was and the damage that it caused, et cetera. And on this slide, I just have a whole list of just some examples um, for future reference. These are examples of some of the things that have been written thus far about the thalidomide story. And if you read some of the titles, you kind of get the sense of where most of them lean, right? So the thalidomide catastrophe, how it happened, who was responsible and why the search for justice continues after more than six decades. That's a long title, kind of tells you what their focus is, right? So a lot of focus on what happened, who did what, and who did what when. So there's a lot of writing about from that perspective. So a lot of them have examined issues of culpability, responsibility, who's to blame, etc. And if we think about that also, that really assumes a rather hierarchical or juridical framework where based, you know, we, we're viewing people in power as hurting and harming those with less power. And I just want to point out also, if we go to the previous slide, that all of these works are written by men. I'm just, that's just an observation I've made is that a lot of the work that's been done thus far that examines this from a real legal and culpability perspective has been written by men. And I just find that really interesting. Um, so what, what I've been thinking about though, and that's really where we're finally getting to what, what I really wanna talk about today with all of you is that it's important to go beyond these interpretations of um, culpability where um, also we're examining it perhaps from a more hierarchical or juridical perspective um, that people in power were harming those without power. Now, to be fair, that is um, 
very, for the most part, that's actually accurate, right? Like at the time, all of the antagonists in this story were men, right? So the scientists at the company, the executives who marketed it, the business leaders who promoted it, the civil servants who approved it, the doctors who prescribed it or suggested it to women, and the politicians who also um, allowed it to happen in their country. So most of those figures were men, the antagonists in, in the story, right? And if, if we take that perspective, then indeed, women who held a lot less power in society at the time were victims in that way, or were oppressed, or were marginalized and under the influence of these more powerful people. And so that hierarchical perspective is helpful in that way. But historian Barbara Clough wrote a really good chapter uh, in 2003, and she points out that it's really important that we complicate the story a little bit as well, that we need to understand the women in the story as um, more than oppressed figures, right? We have to really examine where they were at the time in society and examine their agency as well as the injury that happened to them. And so that was kind of the starting point of my thinking uh, for, for this fellowship and, and you know, how do we connect um, this story with the role of women at the time and the kind of oppression and agency that they were experiencing during this time period and how does that play out in this story right so that was really my starting point is to think about this a little bit more broadly to try and complicate it from from an oppressor oppressed kind of framework acknowledging at the same time that there were vast differences in power and decision-making authority in this story. So my goal was really to situate women at the center of the story and try to examine what, what that positioning actually tells us. What can we learn by putting women at the center of the story and then examining what's kind of revealed to us through that positioning using both feminist and critical disability studies inspired lenses. So I just want to tell a brief story first about um, a recent visit I made to Library and Archives Canada, because it really kind of brought this um, examination into sharper focus for me. So that image on the slide is just a picture of any of you who've had the um, I would say good fortune of being able to visit Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa. That's the outer part of the building. I just put that up there for a little context. Um, very calming kind of place. And the people there have been very helpful. So while I was there, I was there for a visit in February. And while I was there, um, I saw a documentary that was undated, which I found really interesting. Um, I think it was undated because I have a feeling that it was never released to the public. It was a CBC documentary, but I could kind of figure out when it was by the, um, the age of the girl in the video. So I think it was around the mid 1970s. So I saw this documentary and what it did was it featured conversations with a few key players in the Canadian thalidomide story. So it included the doctor, who was who founded uh, the rehabilitation programs for thalidomide affected children in Canada, uh, particularly in Montreal. It also included the dad of one of the thalidomide survivors, and it included the person who was the head of the what was then called the Food and Drug Directorate of Canada, and it also included the federal minister of health. And all of those people spoke at length about their interpretation of the thalidomide tragedy, um, its causes, the effects, what had happened and what needed to happen moving forward. So there were three other people who appeared in the documentary. There was uh, a young thalidomide affected girl who looked to be about 13 years old, um, maybe 14, her mother and an occupational therapist who was also a woman. So in this documentary, the men spoke, and the women were completely silent. And I was just really struck by that. So you've got this girl who is the only one in the film who's actually experiencing this. And you've got the mom who's also directly implicated in the story, completely silent. So all the people who spoke were men with power, most of them, the federal minister of health, um, the head of the food and drug directorate, and this doctor who was leading up the rehabilitation program. So, okay, that could be interpreted as, interpreted as reflective of the gender norms of the day. You know, men were presumed to be experts on public matters of national concern and could 
speak on women's behalf quite adeptly. Um, but I also felt that this unbalanced interpretation or this unbalanced representation could really be interpreted as emblematic of a lot of the, the record on the thalidomide tragedy, right? That this was just a really interesting example of the kind of understanding we have of the situation and who has facilitated that understanding, who has led that. So I think it's important to position women at the middle and try and understand what, what does that reveal to us? What can we learn by doing that? So we can learn about changing interpretations of um, what women are responsible for, what women are capable of. It starts to shed light on constructions about capacity and incapacity, responsibility, agency, ability. It also really, if we think about that maxim from, you know, um, women's movements for decades now is that the personal is political. Well, this story is really takes us to the very end point of that, that phrase, right? The personal is political. And I think along the way, it kind of pushes us to reckon with some kind of tricky, uh, uncomfortable tensions along the way, such as the tension between individual and collective responsibility, between private lives and public lives. Um, also like how much are we all responsible for certain things that happen in society? And um, also I think really importantly and most for our purposes today, the story gives us a lot of insight into cultural perspectives on disability and on feminism's sort of relationship to disability and the disability community in that. Okay. so. So I want to now dig into exploring the context that happened around this story. And again, on the slide is just that abstract image of uh, a person holding a child on their hip. So first of all, I want to talk about the post-World War II context. This is when the thalidomide phenomenon happened, right? The thalidomide tragedy unfolded in the wake of the Second World War. So there's a couple of really important points that we need to be attentive to around that. The first is that, um, uh, sorry, just got to see it. Here we go. Is that this was a time of recovery and rebuilding. There was rapid um, economic and technological growth happening around the world. And I just want to point out that Germany, which is the country from which this drug originated, was being encouraged to develop at a really rapid rate. Um, that charge was really being led to a great extent by the United States that wanted to see Germany as being a strong economic partner. In other words, there was there was a lot of support to get Germany back on its feet in a, in a good way. Um, sorry, that's a kind of an ableist expression. To get Germany functioning again in a good way, um, in a strong way after the war, so that it would be less dependent on allied countries for its recovery and for its functioning. And also partly because the United States in particular was heavily invested in Germany being um, a bulwark against Soviet communist expansion. Remember, the United States was really, really worried about, um, you know, this is the beginning of the Cold War. They were worried about Germany, uh, sorry, Soviet Russia expanding. So they wanted a strong Germany. So what that meant, without going into a ton of detail, is there was not a huge amount of oversight when it came to some parts of the German economy. This is an example of an area where there was not a lot of, of, of sorry, oversight, where development was being encouraged, um, but they were not being adequately checked, right? So this, along with this was, you know, there was a worldwide desire for stability after many decades of instability. So we have the... Um, Depress with the First World War in the 1930s, there was the Depression and then the long Second World War. So the, so the countries who'd been involved were really just really hungry for stability. So this also fed into the position of women. There was this fear of the Cold War. There was a fear of Soviet expansion, which fed into the Cold War. Um, so this really affected a lot of decision making uh, from various governments, particularly in the United States and in Canada. Um, it had a huge influence on policy. So these were all these are all just 
sort of general factors that I want you to think about when we think about the position of women in post-war Canada and how that contributed to what happened here. So I also just want to make a couple of points before I, I go further into really understanding where women were at during this time period, which is really our examination here. And these two points come from Joan Sangster, who's a historian who's written a lot about uh, the Canadian women's movement. So one thing she points out is that we tend to simplify history and kind of break it down into these chunks. And she just wanted to point out that the Canadian women's movement is, in her words, polyphonic, which basically means sounds like a lot of different things, right? It's very uneven. There's all kinds of different voices that have played a role in the Canadian women's movement, in women's liberation, etc. There's different community groups, there's people with different interests, people with different concerns, and that sometimes we tend to think of it as this kind of uniform group of women in Canada who have pushed for certain uh, protections and rights over the decades, but her point is that it's, a, it's more complicated than just that, that there's a whole, we have to acknowledge all the different groups that are sometimes even competing with each other or presenting feminism in a different way. She also um, really encourages us to, she doesn't engage what's typically called the wave theory of feminism because her point is that, um, that the wave theory is more indicative of the priorities of privileged and educated women who had access to an audience as opposed to all women, right? So if we think about um, feminism as work that is constant and over time and persistent, then we realize that maybe the wave analogy actually isn't very accurate, that it only is more representative of certain groups of women who had um, access to an audience at certain historical moments. So she kind of encourages us not to you to engage with the wave theory of feminism. So those are just a couple of points I wanted to make as we launch into this discussion of women in post-war Canada. So the first thing that I want to point out is this idea of a quest for the quest for stability in light of the disruption of the 1930s and 1940s, right? And many historians have written about the, the return to traditional domestic roles for men and women after the Second World War, right? And that really this was about um, a desire to establish a stable home life and a family after all this disruption. And that a suburban lifestyle with ample access to material goods kind of stemmed from that constant deprivation that had existed for the decades previously, right? The other thing that happened is that, I just wanna see what my next point is here. Yeah, is that women were encouraged, many women obviously had started working during the Second World War. Many women were encouraged to give up those positions to make room for the returning veterans. And so the rhetoric from government and culture more generally was that men were to assume the role as breadwinners in the home. Women were returned to the home front where they would become mothers homemakers and the ones kind of holding down the fort. In other words, the quest was to establish a stable home life after these decades of disruption. And um, so there was this emphasis on returning to gender normative and domestic patterns that had existed many decades earlier. At the same time, as I've mentioned already, we have this um, threat of perceived threat of the Cold War and that that many scholars have also written a lot about government rhetoric or propaganda you might say or messaging that was used at the time again to sort of promote that idea of domestic stability and gender normativity and from the way people write about it it's just really really fascinating that governments thought that if you could invest the population, that something about creating normative households was one way 
to develop a sense of national patriotism and that that in itself would work as a tool to stave off the threat of communism. It's kind of interesting thinking, but basically the idea was, was that strong families meant um, a strong country and that a strong country would be more favorable towards capitalism. It would all um, create a better front towards preventing the influx of communist ideas or socialist ideas into Canada. So there's been some really interesting writing about this. It's um, it's kind of fascinating, actually. Um, the other thing that's hard in this is that this idea of normative families, and I've written about this in the past, that it was not an easy time to have a child with a disability because, first of all, there was absolutely no government support for families who had a disabled child at the time. Institutionalization was reaching its peak at this point in the 20th century. Um, so the emphasis was very much on strong, capable, normative families. At the same time, there was also targeted attacks on people who identified as queer within the Canadian civil service. There's been a lot of work on that as well that has shown how the RCMP targeted um, people who were suspected of being queer because the government deemed them as threats to national security, deemed them as being potentially more vulnerable to the ideas of socialism or communism, and thus they were really targeted. This is very much a cold war, a way that the Cold War was lived out in Canada. So there was very, very normative rhetoric going on um, that you know, filtered down to domestic life as well. Men were to be the breadwinners, public life, women were the private um, at the home front, taking care of children, trying to raise healthy, normal children. So that was kind of, um, that's very roughly put, but that's what was being encouraged at the time. Now, if we assume that framing of post-war life, which is what a lot of historians have written about, then it's easy to um, appreciate that women were oppressed in many ways during this time period, right? That they didn't often have a lot of say in the way uh, the home was going to um, happen or in their own dreams of, uh, of a life outside the home was not as easy to recognize. They had to fight for rights and equal recognition, all those things. So if we use this framing, this return, this quest for stability, return to domestic norms, etc., it does help us understand that idea of women's oppression. But at the same time, and this is the point that Barbara Clow really makes in her article, is that there's, there's evidence of women's agency that's developing during this time period as well, right? So at the same time, you've got women who are organizing in mid 20th century Canada. And actually it started as anti-war activism. This is really, really interesting, is that the first sort of, um, in the middle of the 20th century, that that uh, time period, the expression of women's activism, a lot of it was, was anti-war. It was, and it's been referred to as maternal feminism or activist maternalism, which it was basically focused on, let's convince um, politicians to do whatever they could to prevent the onset of war, that the world that we now knew could annihilate whole populations, right? Um, so war, if we think of this, it's kind of interesting that war was an organizing feature of both the return to traditional domestic arrangements, but war was also the instigator for some women's agency and protest and, and resistance. So I find that kind of interesting is that you can sort of see war as a unifying theme throughout all these things, both women's oppression, if we want to call it that, the return to traditional arrangements, which maybe not everybody defines as oppressive, but but also as um as an instigator to women's anti-war activism. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that the war and its aftermath is a big part of this thalidomide story, right? How the, how the drug developed, the world was expanding in terms of economic uh, trade, et cetera, how it was so much easier to promote the drug worldwide, et cetera. So war is an interesting unifying feature here that I actually wanna take more time to explore in my future work. 
So yeah, so there's that point there is that war influenced both the return to, to tradition and the emergence of 20th century women's activism. So in other words, war was a really defining influence here. But the point really on this slide is that while you've got that return to domestic norms and, and uh, roles, you also have women who are beginning to organize and resist and uh, ask for recognition, et cetera. It's going on at the same time. And one of the ways where you could really see that a lot was uh, in the labor force. So despite a lot of rhetoric around women stepping aside for men, allowing returning veterans to assume their previous roles in the workplace, Despite that, and despite the sort of government messaging around the importance of developing strong and healthy families, women's participation in, in the labor force just kept increasing. So it, it didn't stop, even though there was a lot of messaging around, um, you know, the leave it to beaver type of home and mom stays home and takes care of the kids. In spite of that, there actually was a steady increase in women's labor participation. So this is an interesting contradiction that I just think we need to really pay attention to. And it's really interesting because there was um, uh, there was a government report at the time from, it was a 1960 Canadian federal government labor report. And I, I quote from that, that the number of women that were working exceeded any number that might easily have been forecast in 1950. In other words, the government was not expecting women to continue to, to work in the workforce at the rate at which they were doing it. So um, the government sounded as if they were surprised that there was this increase in labor, which I also find really interesting. So in spite of that, so there's all these things going on at the same time, in spite of that, the government messaging was really about the women's place is in the home. And what some research has shown is that some women considered, um, framed their desire to work or their actual work, not necessarily as a right, the way we might frame that today, but rather as something that sometimes needed to be done when the men could not right, when their partners were unable to work, either they were absent or ill or recovering from the war, et cetera, then women would work. So some of the scholarship shows that women didn't necessarily frame it as a human right or as something they wanted to do for themselves, but rather as something that was of necessity, again, for the family and the home. So there's a lot of contradictory sort of messages there and positions of women. But I think what's really important in all of this is just to acknowledge that there's this, there's also these elements of increasing agency for and within women's groups, all women were starting to show more agency in different parts of society, whether it was uh, through labor or anti-war resistance or education. And that kind of complicates this hierarchical or oppressive understandings of the thalidomide story, right? So I, what I think Barbara Clow was really saying was we need to complicate that picture of women being oppressed only. And look at what else was going on. They were also demonstrating signs of agency and um, engagement and decision-making, which contradicts some of that oppressive type or hierarchical framing, right? So um, there's, I see there's a few things in the chat. Is it okay if I just wait till the end? Just because I can get distracted by that. If, if I just leave them for now, I hope that's Absolutely, okay. Absolutely, Madeline. I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. Oh, it's okay. So I'll come back to them, I promise. <laughs> I just, I'm just going to keep going for now, though, if that's okay. For sure. So the other area that is really quite interesting is to think about this story in terms of women's... Um, access to abortion and reproductive rights more generally. So, because in a way that actually I, ha I hadn't really thought about much before I started doing this research is that the stories are actually more connected than I, than I knew, right? So just to point out that, you know, 1969 was the year when Canada's criminal code was changed to decriminalize abortion, but as Stettner points out, Stettner, Shannon Stettner, who's done a lot of writing on abortion history in Canada and access to abortion, she points out that um, 
you know, we really need to go way back in time to understand the whole story, which obviously we don't have time for today, but to just acknowledge historically discussions about the criminalization or decriminalization of abortion goes way back, you know, back into the 19th century and earlier. So this is not a new, this is not only a 20th century, 21st century discussion, right? And that she also points out that often if we look at it in that, with that long view, that it's really more um, a discussion about government regulation of women's bodies and um, medicine's control over women's bodies and also fluctuating social mores, like what, what's considered acceptable and what's considered unacceptable, right? So we need to see it in that light, um, not just as something very recent that, that affects women, right? So, um, what we do know in terms of this story, though, is that we need to focus on that conversation in the 1960s, which is exactly when this story is unfolding. So while it was obvious, it, it didn't really strike me until fairly recently that, of course, the thalidomide tragedy happened right before abortion um, became legal in Canada, right before the criminal code was changed to do decriminalize it. And so that's a very interesting timing, right? So there was increasing support for legal access for abortion through the 1960s. And if you do the reading on it, it's very interesting. It sounds like a lot of that push actually came from the medical profession who wanted protection. They wanted it to be, um, they didn't want it to be illegal for them to perform abortions, they were acting out of the fear that they needed to be protected in their medical practices. So a lot of the pressure to, to move towards legal abortion came actually from doctors, from the medical profession. So I found that very interesting. And in 1969, we arrived at this amendment to the criminal code, which allowed abortions with the approval of a therapeutic abortion committee in a hospital when the pregnancy was considered a threat to the mother's life and health, right? So that was kind of this, this change in Canada's criminal code. But for our purposes today, it's um, really important to think about how this story, the thalidomide story relates to this. So the thalidomide took place before changes in the criminal code. So because of that, we will probably never know to what extent abortion played a role in women's experiences here, at least in Canada. Um, if women suspected that they had taken thalidomide and they were worried and decided to have to terminate their pregnancy, it's very unlikely that we will be able to find out much about that. Um, first of all, it was quite a while ago now, but also it's unlikely that women are um, would be wanting to, to share about that decision making. Um, so just to say that's a difficult piece of history that would be really hard to tap into at this point. Um, What's interesting is that the United States had a very obvious situation or case that really shed light on this. So there was a woman named Sherry Finkbein in the United States, and she was a very um, famous figure. She was a TV show host of a show called Romper Room, which some of you may have heard of. It was a popular children's show in the 1960s. She had four children of her own, and she was really portrayed in the media she was a celebrity of that domestic idyllic lifestyle. This was a mom who had four children. She was beautiful. She was engaging. She was charismatic. And she happened to be the host of this very, very popular children's TV show. So she was very famous. She became pregnant with their fifth child. And then she realized that she had the news started coming out about connections between thalidomide and um, potential danger to fetuses, and then she realized that she had consumed some of that drug. So she sought an abortion. And while it seemed as though she was going to be able to access one in the United States, then that access was denied her. So she traveled to Sweden to get the abortion. And this was a huge story in the United States with many people um, criticizing her and her husband for seeking out an abortion um, out of suspicion that they were concerned that the fetus might have impairments. There were other people who came out um, in support of them. So it was a very, very public event, very um, uh, contentious, I guess, a lot of argument on both sides. So 
that really brought that into the American conversation, which was interesting because thalidomide was actually never approved in the United States formally, yet there were many children with thalidomide caused impairments born in the United States through things like free samples of the drug, et cetera. That's a whole other story. But there's, we don't have an equivalent story in Canada where a woman was publicly known to have sought uh, to terminate her pregnancy if she suspected that she had consumed thalidomide. So we don't have the similar, a similar, um, that point of exploration in this area, right? But what's really interesting is that thalidomide played a really key role in arguments that came after this in support of legal access to abortion. So if you look at the records of the debates that happened in Parliament between 1967 and 69, this is when the parliamentary debates were happening about amending the criminal code to allow legal access to abortion. What's interesting is that thalidomide was really uh, repeatedly invoked to increase support for legal access to abortion. So this is a quote from um, McInnes, who was a member of Parliament from British Columbia, um, that she made in, I believe it was 19, it was either 67 or 68, she invoked the story of thalidomide and the children who'd been born in her promotion for legal access to abortion. So she said, I think that women ought to have far more control over what happens to them when monstrosity, monstrosities, and I use air quotes there, when monstrosities are to be born. I have known women who have had to put up with that sort of thing, and it would have been better both for them and for those poor little deformed creatures to have never been brought into the world. So pretty heavy, strong language that she was pointedly using to further the, um, the abortion, this, the perspective on, on the debate around abortion access, right? She was trying to facilitate or increase support for this bill to pass. And this, these are the words that she was using. So um, just to say that the, it, it's interesting that when we think now about access to abortion, it is primarily framed as a rights issue. But when we go back into the history, we realize that disability was, was actually used um, both in Canada, and you'll see in a few minutes later in the United States, as a way to um, facilitate or promote the, the passage of legislation that would make access to abortion legal. So uh, we don't really think about that now. It's framed mostly now as a, as a rights issue, but in the history, disability was actually playing a pretty pivotal role in the arguments. The, because the outcome of the thalidomide tragedy, that the general consensus publicly was that disability must be prevented. So disability, from that perspective, was used as a tool in the abortion debate. And I don't mean that to say um, that, you know, I'm not really arguing for or against access to abortion. It's just to acknowledge that disability was invoked as a way to support arguments towards access to abortion. And that's just really something that's important from a historical perspective to acknowledge, right? To, to recognize that that was happening. So really interestingly then, the thalidomide story in particular reframed access to abortion. So previously to this time, this, it reframed abortion from something that was considered deviant to something that was considered decent. And this was really closely imbricated with race and class as well. So on that point, I've drawn a quote from some writing by Leslie Regan, who's written about this. And it's just really interesting to sort of understand that whole context. So Regan says, and I quote, the Thalidomide produced a new image of abortion as a respectable, sorry, a new image of abortion as respectable and as a need of married middle-class white women. Whiteness as an idea, as a picture and as privilege coupled with heterosexuality, marriage, motherhood, 
middle class status and the fear of disabilities helped to repaint the portrait of abortion and change the politics of abortion. So thalidomide was part of that conversation. The outcome of the thalidomide story became part of that conversation of shifting abortion from something that deviant women wanted to something that decent women needed, right? And so there's this really strong overlap with uh, conversations around race and class as well. And um, so again, I just think it's really important that we acknowledge the role that, that how those are all intersecting and how they contribute to this, this conversation. And from that point onward, what Regan and others have pointed out is that disability also invoking the thalidomide tragedy has also been used as a tool to promote public health messages about prenatal and postnatal care. And a really good example of that is the German measles scare in the United States, which immediately followed the thalidomide story where um, women were being cautioned against contracting measles they were called rubella or German measles uh, for fear of damaging the fetus. And they, in that public health messaging, they would again, remind people of the thalidomide tragedy. Remember what happened there. You don't want that to happen here. And so you need to take precautions, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I'm not arguing against public health messaging. And of course I'm, uh, you know, I think prenatal care is obviously an important um, thing to be attentive to, but what we need to acknowledge is that disability historically has often been invoked to facilitate that messaging and to facilitate different arguments. So when I've been thinking through this, and this is just something I'm sort of coming to over the last few days, I wanna spend some more time with this, is can we consider the thalidomide story as, um, an instigator, sort of one of the like, or like a template to future conversations on the still fraught relationship between access to abortion and disability. So if, I don't know how familiar the students are right now with sort of that um, historically, not always uh, like productive and yet sometimes contentious relationship between um, uh, feminism and access to abortion arguments, as well as disability rights arguments. It's, it's a conversation which is ongoing and productively, it has a lot of productive potential, but it's also had um, contentious phases and sometimes is, is fraught still. So I think that um, this story can help us in those conversations, but also historically to think about the thalidomide tragedy as it, it's being, it has been used as a template or sort of a model of how to argue for certain health measures um, because of the threat or fear of disability. And I just think that's something really important to pay attention to. The last thing I wanna just talk about before we move into the, the concluding parts of my talk, and I thank you for your incredible attention, I realize I've talked for a long time, is that um, is the rapidly expanding pharmaceutical uh, industry after the war. But I also want to talk about drugs, not just sort of legal pharmaceuticals, but also illegal drugs and how that culture expanded so much after the Second World War. And I put on the slide that this is a nexus between women's agency and paternalism. And um, the reason I said that is because uh, drugs is one area or pharmaceuticals where I feel that women were sort of um, a little bit caught in the middle between those two forms of being interpreted, right? Whether they were um, paternalistically being looked at as incapable or also taking agency in their own lives and doing things that they thought would help them feel better, right? So it's just important to acknowledge that um, there was, you know, along with the rapid development that I spoke about earlier, there was a lot of technological development after the war, a lot of medical development, economic expansion, and this included the pharmaceutical industry. At the same time, along with all these sweeping, sweeping advancements, this uh, scholars have written about the increasing anxiety in the population, right? There were, although the Second World War was over and um, generally people were living economically more secure lives, et cetera, there was also the, cold, the threat of the Cold War, 
There were nuclear and communist threats. There was change because of the civil rights movements and the women's movements, which made some parts of the population anxious. There was also sort of peaceniks, people resisting war, people resisting the Vietnam War, et cetera. And along with this increasing anxiety were concerns about increases in suicide. And in addition to all of those advancements, we also had people like Aldous Huxley. He was the author who wrote Brave New World, the, the end of the 1950s. He even wrote a, a published piece in the UK about the potential for mind altering drugs to advance society. So you've got this kind of um, all these different factors uh, together, creating the idea that maybe pharmaceuticals and drugs can play a role in this new modern society. So first of all, there was the actual corporate development of pharmaceuticals, but there was also public sort of secular use thinking maybe this was a good way to deal with some of the anxieties of the modern age, including very public figures like Huxley. So thalidomide kind of filled that niche, like I'm not sure how much um, sort of visioning around that the, the company did in Germany that developed thalidomide, but certainly it filled a niche around, we have these drugs, we're gonna meet the needs of an anxious population and thalidomide was marketed as a drug that would help to do that. And the company was really clear was that you could not overdose on thalidomide. So therefore it minimized the risk of suicide. They said it was non-addictive. They also said it was completely safe. And of course we know now that that was false advertising and they had not done adequate testing, but thalidomide really fit into that post-war um, quest for expanding humanity, but also dealing with the anxiety of the age. So it's interesting because the little mind kind of plays both sides of this, this part of the story, right? So there was this modernity and nervous conditions that went along with modernity. The little mind was essentially a tranquilizer and women were often, especially if they were pregnant, were considered as needing it. And for me, that's a little bit of a paternalistic interpretation of women that when we are expecting um, that when we're uh, when we're pregnant, that we need something to help us cope with the pregnancy. So for me, that's a little bit of a paternalistic interpretation. So that's where I see this kind of nexus. On the one hand, you've got this increasing ability for women to take ownership of their own bodies and to show increasing agency, including ma maybe making the choice to consume a drug that they think is going to help them to feel better. And on the other hand, you've got women who were deemed as needing something in order to cope. And there, there are a few mothers that I spoke with and a few thalidomide survivors who speak about consuming the drug because their doctor said, this will help you feel better. This will help you to cope with the anxiety of being pregnant with your fourth or fifth child or whichever one it was, right? And sometimes husbands recommended to their wives, wives that, they, that they try it. So by nexus, I mean this kind of point of intersection with, between these two sort of competing uh, forces around the consumption of medication and what that actually means. So kind of stemming from that, I'm just going to now just draw a few simple conclusions before I finish. And again, I thank you for your incredible attention. So first of all, so I'm just going to kind of run through about five or six um, implications that I think we can draw from this story. The first one is that, and kind of the biggest one that I'm sort of grappling with, is that how we interpret women in this story can inform how we understand the factors that gave rise to the tragedy, right? Or that that contributed to this thing from, un, that contributed to its unfolding, right? So one is that when we acknowledge that women at this time period did have increasing agency and were starting to make decisions about their own well-being and were making some choices, this complicates that framing of perpetrators and victims. It complicates the story of who was responsible and who was oppressed in this story and who were the victims. And the reason I think that is really important is not to say 
to start um, necessarily spreading blame around. That's not really what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is that we need to understand um, how how do these bad situations arise in the first place? If we think about the ways in which some people gain power, for example, sometimes the easy way out is to say, well, they were bad people and bad people supported them and that's how they became powerful. But we have to acknowledge it's more complicated than that, right? That, that there's much broader ways in society, conditions that contribute to things developing. And it's the same with this story here. We need to understand what were the conditions that contributed to it, because that's how we can stop things from happening in the future or change directions in the future, is when we recognize the conditions that are contributing instead of just pinning it on a few people. So it's sort of to complicate that picture of implication and uh, sorry, complicate the picture of perpetrators and victims. The second thing is that how we interpret women in the story also informs what we understand about what happened in the aftermath, right? So if the framing emphasized um, women as being victims or that women, when, when women are expecting they need assistance, I think that that contributed to narrative or discourse afterwards that really emphasize the need for government to step in to help the parents, but primarily the mother to raise the child. That a lot of women actually, after they gave birth to a child who was affected by uh, thalidomide, um, was deemed as incapable of raising them. That somehow the fact that they consumed the drug, even if they were told that they should do that, they were then given the message that, okay, so you're not a good enough mom and you're incapable of raising the child. So I think when women are framed as being non-agentic in this story, it actually can further the idea that they weren't able to raise the child afterwards. And the reason why I think that's important is that it kind of um, made the government intervention that happened more acceptable. It was considered reasonable because in Canada, what happened was that four different rehabilitation centers were developed they were highly medicalized, highly rehab focused, and the government had a lot of intervention with families. Now, I think a lot of families would say that a lot of that was quite helpful, um, but the government, to be fair, didn't really give families what they wanted, which was financial support. Instead, they said, this is what we're going to give you. So I think this framing of women as non-agentic contributes to that idea that it's okay, the government knows what to do, we're going to take charge and we're going to move in here and do what we need to do to make this child as normal in air quotes as possible and um, if necessary remove the child from the family because you're not capable of raising them so I kind of feel like this style of government intervention that happened was very much facilitated by this framing of women as being oppressed in this whole situation and again, a third point kind of stemming from that, the one just previously, if we kind of go back to Klaus' work, is that we have to address the tension that this story raises, right? If we agree that women have the right to direct their own healthcare choices, then there's inevitably going to be some risk in that and that we, um, we that, that there might be more openings for women to be blamed for plate for any of the ill health or disability of their children and she states that not as inevitable an inevitable happening but rather that there that it's a social tendency that if we give people more independence then we can also somehow feel that it's justified to assign blame and on the other hand though if we delegate control to authority figures then we risk the opposite, which is placing women on the spectrum of paternalism and having a locus of control that is outside of themselves, right? So we really need to unpack this tension a little bit more. I guess my question is, after reading Klaus' article, is just to think about, is there a third way? How do we think about alternate ways of viewing and understanding women's position in this, as, as opposed to just being victimized, um, and blamed for something or somebody who doesn't have any agency. So um, anyway, so I kind of feel like I wanna explore whether there's a third way there. 
The, another point is that this really does expand our discussion and understanding of the history of access to abortion from one that is rights-based to one that includes the idea of avoidance of disability. And that whole conversation really solidified existing tropes of disability. And um, it also, when we think about disability being seen as a problem, it um, solidifies the public's felt need to rely on government and the market to solve this problem of disability, right? So um, when disability is invoked in abortion access arguments, it can kind of perpetuate those historical tropes of disability being a problem and uh, sort of justify certain approaches to it. And also just really interesting, and this is more from a, um, disability studies perspective is that thalidomide survivors don't necessarily identify with what I put in quotes here as the conventional disability rights movement. Um, their interpretation of rights has primarily to do with prioritizing the right to be compensated for what happened to them, right? So there, there's less of the sort of typical disability rights movement that's been put forward by the social model over the last 40 years and rather thinking about it differently, that they were harmed and therefore they should have access to financial compensation so they can live a reasonably good life, right? And I just put a point there at the bottom, we don't have time to get into it today, but this aligns with really emergent critical disability studies scholarship, for example, by Jasper Puar, who has write, written really provocative work on, she worked in war zones around the world and she's interviewed people who have been injured through war. And she, she observes that some of the people in those situations do not identify as disabled necessarily, but they identify as victims of war. In other words, um, someone who has suffered because of human, error or human instigated actions. And so the little my victims actually are in a similar situation um, that they were, their impairments were brought about through, um, you could say corporate greed, bad decision-making, powerful structures, etc. And so it's really interesting that Puar's work on war I think aligns really closely with this, this group of people um, that falls outside the typical disability rights movement discussions. And just to say finally that I think this there's a lot of productive potential in this story because you know there's a lot in the thalidomide story that overlaps with other work that feminists have already done. So things like disciplining bodies, normalizing bodies, when we think of the rehabilitation thalidomide children had to go through um, and seeing bodies as a social and political issue as opposed to a medical one. It also brings up uh, thinking around the creation of impairment through profit making, through capitalism, and that's often to be found in what I call echo disability studies feminism <laughs> intersections, right? So all I'm saying here with this slide is that I think there's a lot of potential for really productive future interdisciplinary scholarship even just using this one story as the starting point. So that's really all I wanna say. I just think that um, it also, thinking about this has made me think a lot about the idea of culpability is that, you know, how do we all participate in stories like this? Do the choices we make. Um, sometimes our choices mm, can have really unjust and difficult outcomes, right? And how much are we all implicated in that? So it, get, it has made me think more about how to think about possible outcomes before we launch into what we think are new or better ways of being. So that's it. And again, I thank you. Wow, I went totally way over time. So you guys are amazing <laughs> for your attention. So thank you. And I will, I will close my slide so I can see everyone's Thank you so much, Madeline. This this was very, very rich. I think you'll have um, more than a few papers to work on um, on many different fronts, actually, intersecting um, different fields. Um, since you mentioned the chat, uh, there were uh, a couple of points, two points, and 
I was guilty. I was responding to David, thanking him, and my message combined was combined with a previous message that I was sending to our wonderful coordinator, Liel, asking her to leave if she wanted to leave. Anyway, um, I I have a number of questions for you, but not to take advantage of my prerogative here. I guess I should just open it to the floor and then come back to myself. Um, so people with questions, you could raise hands and my, I will be watching. Madeline, you could, if you could pay attention as well, that would be great. So I don't miss sure. anyone or people could just start speaking. That's not a problem either. Yeah, so, I'm happy. So if people want to use the raise hand function or just say something. Jump in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do see a comment. Maybe I'll just read one of the comments to get us started. Um, Andrea said, this reminds me a lot of the case with DES. So I'm not sure what DES is, Andrea. I don't know if you can clarify that for me or if I'm just not tuning into the acronym. Yes, um, there was a drug that was used actually earlier than thalidomide, and it was used for women to try to prevent miscarriages. And it was taken for quite a long time. And what happened was after you know several years, children were, were born to these women, either with birth defects or um, subsequent health problems down the road, specifically certain types of cancers. Um, so it was a very similar, you know, it just reminded me a lot of the same kind of case because, you know, there were, there were so many people that were impacted by this drug and it took years and years and years for really anyone to take action. And, um, I think it's still impacting people to this day. Interesting. Um, and just an aside from Andrea's comment too, is just to say that Thalidomide is still being used in different places of the world. Um, it uh, We didn't have time to get into it really with the talk, but it was approved as a cancer treating um, medication in the early 2000s, which was, it's a whole interesting other conversation that the thalidomide survivors in Canada had to speak with representatives from the pharmaceutical company that wanted to bring it back as a cancer treating agent. And it's also been used to treat um, leprosy. But it's, the hard thing is, is that more children are, continuing to be born with impairments in places like Brazil. Brazil has a very large thalidomide affected population. And a lot of that was just was due to um, lack of labeling and education and the wide distribution of the, the drug, et cetera. Um, I've seen some of the bottles and it shows like a, a pregnant woman with an X through it. And I think what I heard was that some women thought that meant that if you took the drug, you wouldn't get pregnant. So, you know, so there was, there's a lot of lack of education and, and understanding about it as well that's ongoing. So anyway, thank you, Andrea, yeah. for that point. Um, uh, so I'm just, David is, has written a really interesting comment. I don't know if you want to, contribute that David I guess you published it to everyone so <laughs> I don't know if you want to add anything um that your mom was not was not encouraged by her doctor to take it but was yeah uh, for, for me it was a it was a close call um because it was discussed as a distinct possibility but the the doctor um, had seen some of the research involved in the approvals process and, and didn't feel that it was rigorous or thorough enough. And so for that, for that reason, <clears throat> she told my mother she was not recommending it. But because of this, but sometimes we would be out, you know, um, in public and my mom would see, you know, children with, with some of the, um, some of the manifestations of the, uh, of the disability and, and she would say, you know, this could have been, this could have very easily been us. Um, mm -hmm. So we always felt a great sympathy and, and compassion for, um, for these, for these, these children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. It was really, my mother is dead now, but she, I'm sure she would have been fascinated by your, by your talk. It was really, you know, they were thorough and rigorous and um, really good. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
Go ahead, hang on. So, Madeline, maybe I can throw the first question yes. and then we'll see where that uh, gets us. So I, um, this was really fascinating and I was fascinated by um, your grappling with the concept of agency all throughout mm -hmm. um, and not coming to your work with pretending or that you have a clear sense of what agency should mean mm -hmm. for us now looking back at the history of 60 something years ago mm -hmm. um, and the fact that obviously one can see women's agency at that point in the 1960s or later on dealing with the consequences of this later on in one way and today in some other way uh, what possibly could helpful, and it may not, uh, could be helpful is to consider that this is the same struggle one could have with the abstract concept of agency when you think about government regulation almost in any domain, right? Mm -hmm. We tend to think that it's more serious when it comes to women or mm -hmm. to some other quote-unquote presumably vulnerable group but let's just I'm just making this up I don't know how it would fly but let's just think of the impact of smoking right so let's just assume that there are differences between different kinds of cigarettes mm -hmm. and so one particular company has come forward with a product that is actually more harmful in a much more serious way or in more serious ways than we already know about the general uh, use of the um, uh, of the general basically uh, consequences of smoking and then let's imagine that you know, now 10 years later, we have learned that actually this particular brand has led to various kinds of cancer or different um, difficult illnesses. And now we need to figure out what the regulator, the society should have done, the government should have done in this particular context. And then let's imagine that, you know, either by coincidence or because of particular branding, this particular brand had appealed to a particular segment of the society. Let's just assume that is appealed to people between 20 and 25, right? We would probably be facing the same question of whether the government should have taken a more mm -hmm. forceful approach just because the target group, the market for this product was a younger market that mm. could be influenced more easily or not. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is a question of degree when we are talking about in the context of women, because of our conceptions of the vulnerability of women, uh, Hmm. tend to think that this is an easier case, but maybe it's really not, right? And if that's the case, then I'm not sure to what extent agency becomes a useful framework here, mm -hmm. other than the fact that, uh, you know, the instance where the product is designed particularly to help women to deal with consequences of pregnancy because there's an assumption about how women handle pregnancy right mm -hmm. it's only probably in that particular or very very specific context that agency might become a useful analytical tool mm -hmm. to try to figure out what's going on mm -hmm. right it's a, a good point I mean back to the thinking then <laughs> like sort of what is the sort of a productive way of analyzing it you know so thank you I appreciate that insight that is it because we are that I'm focusing on women that I invoked that 
analytical tool. That's right, a libertarian, a libertarian might tell you, have, I, have we not been telling you all along, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leave people alone, give them the tools to figure out what to do and don't, you know, mm -hmm. it might be as general as that for a libertarian, right? Mm -hmm. But someone slightly closer um, to the more um, bigger government approach might tell you, you know, we don't need intervention all along, but maybe not G. Maybe there has to be some nudging all along. And then mm -hmm. when you move to the other side of the political spectrum, obviously, as you move forward to the left, people might have you know, more serious responses to this. I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe this is not really so much, this concept of agency is not the key to open mm -hmm. the lock on this door. Um, Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's just a question of let's actually look at the intersection of feminism and disability rights mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And well, I have a few things to say on that as well, but I might, I should stop and ask if there are other comments and then I'll come back to this if there isn't still enough time. Mm -hmm. David. <laughs> I, I had a, a question for you. Um, do you think that it do you think that it's important that the um, the gender of the medical practitioners and in my mom's case it was a female endocrinologist that that made the decision not to proceed, um, but but at that time in the fifties I I think um, female doctors were a relative rarity, and and certainly a specialist like an endocrinologist. So I wondered um, about sort of the the intersections. Um, uh, 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 between the the practitioners, the male and the female, and the different power dynamics, and if if um, uh, because it was uh, female health that was at, at issue, was it um, less of a, a, a priority? It'd be, it'd be interesting to hear, hear your thoughts on sort of the, those sorts of power uh, dynamics in the prescription and also yeah. the, the research and the. Well, certainly, I mean that. You can't, I mean, you can't help but consider to what extent um, that might have played a role in the way conversations were happening and how decisions were made. Um, you're right that the vast majority of doctors were not women during this time period, but in terms of actually knowing the extent to which that had an effect, I don't know that we'll ever find out for sure because um i mean that is anyway it's a good question and sort of worth exploring like i do know that one thalidomide survivor spoke to me about his mother's doctor being a woman who had also recommended that that the mom take this medication so that might have been a rare case but certainly that did exist you know what i mean so i think it's worth looking into that but then also thinking about what Hengama just said like um what what is the most sort of productive analytical way to look at this you know but certainly women certainly men held more positions of power at the time than women did like I think it's possible to say that right and that that we need to understand to what extent that had an effect on decision making definitely in terms of knowing, you know, um, the actual numbers of female doctors and things like that, that would be much harder to find out. So I know that doesn't really directly answer your question. I've certainly thought about that as the medical profession being dominated by men, for sure, during that time period, and having a great, great deal of influence. They were really trusted in ways that we can't even really comprehend right now, 60 years later in terms of the, the amount of power that they actually held. I mean, this was a time when doctors also held political positions. You know, ministers of health were often doctors at that time. So there was an enormous amount of influence coming from the Canadian Medical Association and Health Canada as well. So good question, David. I'm sorry, I'm not giving a really fulsome answer to it, but it's definitely worth considering. And I see that Catherine also has her hand up. Hi, so this isn't a fully formed thought yet, 
but in terms of you know leaving room for women to have agency maybe also like holding space for the women who genuinely did have very difficult pregnancies that mm -hmm. had conditions that required treatment rather than you know classifying them all as paternalistic views of mm -hmm. you know women can be a little bit anxious when they're pregnant and remembering you know there can be debilitating morning sickness and mm -hmm. it was uh prescribed for that use and um maternal depression and stuff like that that there mm -hmm. are also genuine uh, medical issues that some of them needed to have solved absolutely yeah you're right and and i didn't get into that much in this talk at all but certainly that was a reality for many women is actually being uncomfortable and seeking some kind of uh, relief from that and that this was offered as something that was considered safe right so yeah that's a really good point Catherine thank you to just remind us of that um I also see one from Susan um so I can just read it out loud I guess in the chat Susan unless you want to say it um I also wonder how women feel that they are able to access supports. Oh, there you are. Hi, Susan. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say your question. Um, yeah, I don't know how good my my audio is. Can can people hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm a colleague of Madeline. So Madeline, thank you so much. For, at least your talk was really great. Um, yeah, I, I think it echoes the, the comment before. Um, also, just uh, I think uh, current. I mean, we're we're in 2023, and um, women are starting to to talk about just how how ill uh, some women become during pregnancy, and just really feeling uh, that they're not listened to. Um, and you know, we talk about that a lot in in healthcare. And then also recently, you know, there's there's more discussion happening even on menopause because that's been so dismissed as well. And you know, either a lot of fear mongering or um, uh, you know, oh, it's it's not that bad. And they always talk about some women just sail through pregnancy or sail through menopause, right? And they have no symptoms at all. Um, and then there's others who are just um, you know, could use the word suffering, and um, and then they're also dismissed, or there's no interest in in uh, trying to to support them, even though that's a, a large uh, group of people. So I don't know how that the question of agency is interesting. I find because mm -hmm. I don't know how to answer it either, Madeline. But it's mm -hmm. it's gotten me thinking. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's the whole thing about agency, and and if that is invoked as a way to kind of understand this is that agency can also mean asking for help when you think you need it and uh, receiving it, right? And making sure that you get what you need. So there's so many different ways to interpret it. Um, but I, yeah, so it's, it's just such a great point. So thank you for bringing that up again, kind of similar to what Catherine said. Mm -hmm. Madeline, as I was just um, uh, listening now to the uh, last question, an email came to my inbox, paternalism, public health, and the nanny state. How <laughs> serendipitous is that one? <laughs> Interesting. So it's a question of regulation. Any other questions? So maybe I can take us back to what you were uh, very helpfully exploring on um the um superficially it could be considered to be a contradiction maybe a tension but as you were also saying that maybe it's more complicated than that between um what now we consider to be the disability rights movement and what then was the social demand for abortion Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as I was listening to you, I was thinking that, and that's partly why I uh, started by saying that you have a bunch of papers out of this mm -hmm. subject, um, is the clash of social demands that sometimes very conveniently we try to capture under identities, right? And so when people talk about identity politics, they actually talk about 
the fact that these social demands become so political and at times politicized and mostly look at the tension between uh, those demands and whatever that is opposing those demands, right? Put it on left, right, or whatever other uh, political polarization that you may want to imagine for that. But in fact, when people talk about identity politics, there is something a lot more important captured by that, and that's the internal contradictions between these different demands. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting. I don't know if this is part of your thinking or that's even another angle that you are looking to explore as you are uh, continuing with this um, subject, that to what extent actually our role today as historians of social movements, what you're trying to do, um, is only to highlight those tensions at the time. It's another aspect of it to consider as uh, you very correctly identified as an important factor, or is it something that is actually inspiring what we are doing today? Mm -hmm. Because if it's inspiring what we are doing today, then a lot of what you know these days again very com conveniently we try to categorize under equity could actually be at odds mm -hmm. these wants or desires could be at odds with one another mm -hmm. and so just in the same way that those folks at the time were not cognizant of this tension or they were but the tension was not important everybody was asking what they were asking for we are not any more cognizant of the tensions running through the equity discourse in our time either. So sometimes I wonder how long it will take, you know, the future generation to look back at us and see these tensions. But the question is that beyond historical interest in these tensions, now that we have the hindsight of history looking at what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s, especially in the 60s and 70s when different kinds of rights or rights movements were taking shape, what should that tell us mm -hmm. for what we are doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's that, thank you. That's a really good um, encouragement to kind of go further. I think, um, that the conversation at the end around identity that I brought up at the very, very end of the talk for me is one of real interest because it, um, I think it encourages the disability rights movement and disability studies as well to, to, you know, to go beyond our conversations that we've had around the social model and its importance and that we need to start thinking about how different people and different groups identify differentially within that umbrella, you know, and what that tells us about the situation in the world. So I kind of, when you say, are we, is our role as social historians to identify tensions or is it inspiring what we do today? I mean, of course, I would hope that it was the latter, <laughs> that it can inspire what we do today and that we get beyond just naming the tensions, right? Um, that's just, that's a lot more work to sort of figure out how it can be applied to inform the way forward. I mean, I always think that complicating history helps us to understand it better. When there are quite simply said bad things that have happened, the more we can really unpack that history, I think we're on a better track towards re like preventing its repetition, you know? Um, like, under so I just think that's why I would prefer to complicate the history and try and really figure out all the different angles, even if it's incomplete, then to um, ignore that, you know? Oh, absolutely. And then that's the bedrock for, that's basically the platform for you to 
take the next step, right? Or anyone, someone else, right? That's the nature of a scholarship that somebody else might use this work then to look at these interconnections and sometimes ironies in the complicated relationship between different identities in our time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I hear you. Good point, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there any other, we are, we have exactly one minute left, but obviously I'm open to one quick question or point if there is anything left, if um, not. Hi, Professor, do you think I yeah. could uh, try Absolutely. to make it? Absolutely. So thank you for the presentation. I think it was really interesting. The one thing that um, uh, actually came to mind was that uh, I actually studied a lot of environmental law, and I was wondering if you drew any connections between this story and that of um, uh, Vietnamese women and Agent Orange during uh, the Vietnamese War. Yes. It sounded to me like there were a lot of um, connections you could make. It sounded very similar. And then there's this added difficulty and added intersectionality of um, perhaps it being imposed upon them even to a greater extent than that of, uh, you know, doctors or husbands imposing this on uh, wives and patients. Yeah, that's such a great point. Thank you. Um, is it Jin? Um, oh, I don't know if I'm saying your name correctly. Yeah, Jin's good. And thank you for that. And it's so interesting you say that because that is a huge area of interest for me that didn't really come into the talk today. But just that idea of environmentally caused impairments and, and by environmental I also mean it could be war could be pollution could be you know dumping of toxic waste whatever and how that's really an emerging area in critical disability studies scholarship around we need to be attention to the overlap the interdisciplinarity between um you know environmental studies and environmental activism and disability and impairment. And that's another area that Jasper Puar has written quite a bit on in her work on debility. And so that's another, definitely that's come up for me in this whole topic. So yeah, thank you for that observation. Yeah, someone was saying the other day that all the cool kids are working on disability and disaster these days. Oh. <laughs> that's to be part of the cool kids, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Madeline. This was extremely interesting and thought provoking. And I'm really glad we had an opportunity to host the talk and combine it with our classroom time. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have been able to do anything more interesting on um, uh, reproductive technology and disability than one example even though medication is per se probably not technology, but is part of medical advancement, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm sure the participants in my class join me in expressing their gratitude to the fact that you took the time and prepared the talk for the Institute and for the class today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for your attention and for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, David, did you have a quick question, David? <laughs> yeah, just for Hanger, I wanted to thank you for opening it up to other people at, at York. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to you, um, Hanger, for, for Absolutely. Doing that, I'm so glad that. you could come. Thank you. And, and thank you, Madeline. I, when I was thinking about um, joining CDS, um, I had uh, coffee with you many years ago, and, and oh, you were I so helpful. <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, I just didn't, I didn't really, there you are. Yeah. I didn't recognize you first. So thank you for reminding me. Well, you were, you were so wonderful and, and so encouraging. And I'm, I want to thank you and say how grateful I am. And, and your talk today was, was fascinating. Your talk today was, was really fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, David. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.